Hello, uh, this is History 475, uh, and I am Dr. Ron Trailer. <clears throat> um, we are going to begin the course by discussing the events uh, that take place right after uh, the uh, Constitution is written and written and approved by the Constitutional Convention, but before it is ratified by the state. Now remember, it is a two-step process. Uh, first of all, the document had to be approved of by the convention itself, or it would have never gone out to the states. The second uh, part of the process is that it is sent out to the 13 states, um, and in order to uh, become... Uh, in order to go into effect, requires the approval, the ratification, if you will, of nine of the 13 states. So that's where we are now. The document uh, was sent out from the Philadelphia Constitutional Convention uh, in September of 1787. Um, the Constitutional convention itself and the American public at large were generally divided. They were conflicted over whether or not to approve uh, the Constitution. There was one group that has, it has uh, become known uh, in history as the Federalists. Uh, the Federalists uh, approved the uh, adoption the ratification of the Constitution, uh, and many of the famous founding fathers of the nation were, in fact, Federalists, people like Washington, John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, all were Federalists, all supported uh, the approval of the Constitution, and yet there was another group uh, they called themselves, it's easy to remember what they called themselves, they called themselves the Anti-Federalists. Um, and it was composed of equally famous Americans. Patrick Henry, for example, was an Anti-Federal. And the Anti-Federalists opposed the ratification of the Constitution. It's not that the content not that what was there was bad. It's what wasn't there. Because uh, many Americans, even today, unless they take Dr. Trailer's class, don't realize that uh, some of the most precious uh, content of the Constitution uh, that's there today was not there in 1787 or 1788. I'm sorry. Um, and, of course, the most famous uh, deficiency was the Constitution did not contain a Bill of Rights. And generally, it is fair to say that most anti-federalists based their opposition to ratification on that fact. It did not contain a Bill of Rights. Now, let's talk about the bill, this Bill of Rights This uh, for just a moment before we, before we continue. Uh, as far as I know, uh, well, I know that every state had a state constitution. Uh, so, uh, if I ask you on a quiz or an exam what came first, state constitutions or the national constitution, I hope that you give me the correct answer, which is state constitutions. And these state constitutions, almost without fail, contain a section that was dedicated to um, a so-called Bill of Rights. And so a Bill of Rights was not uh, uh, something new to Americans. Every one of their states uh, had constitutions, and most of those constitutions had uh, Bills of Rights. Now, the Federalists, were probably better organized than the uh, Anti-Federalists. The Federalists probably represented a more articulate part of the American, the, the population, 
at that time. Uh, many of the Federalists lived in or near uh, the cities of the nation. And let me stop right now and let you know that I'm referring to these as cities because they were the largest towns in the nation, New York, Philadelphia, Boston, right? But the reality is that no city in America in 1787, 1788, was larger than about fifteen or 20,000 people. We would consider it a small town. Well, what I'm calling a city uh, was, in fact, uh, in a modern sense, uh, a rather small town. Town. But even though the towns were small, they had small populations, these cities, and let's call them that now, okay, these cities had, uh, they were very important. Uh, if you look at a map, you'll see that uh, almost every city in the United States at the time of the writing of the Constitution was on the Atlantic Ocean. Either it was on the Atlantic Ocean, like New York or Boston, or Charleston, or Savannah, or it was near the ocean. Uh, Baltimore was on Chesapeake Bay, but Chesapeake Bay is an inlet of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, Philadelphia. Philadelphia was not on the ocean, uh, but it was on a river, uh, the Delaware River, by the way, uh, that emptied into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Philadelphia was sort of like New Orleans is today. New Orleans is not on the ocean. It's not on the Gulf of Mexico, but it is considered to be a seaport, as is Baton Rouge and Natchez and Vicksburg and St. Louis. They're all considered to be seaports because the river empties into the ocean and is and the ocean is easily accessible from those cities. So. Many of the Federalists lived in or near these early American cities, which were very important because uh, it was into these American cities that things came from other countries. Uh, and it was out of these cities that American goods were exported abroad. The Anti-Federalists quite often were small farmers, uh, frontiersmen. Uh, if they lived in a town, it was a really small town. It was a village. Um, many felt that a government without a Bill of Rights would trample on the rights of its citizens. Uh, and let's talk about that for a moment. The Bill of Rights. Who does, we, we, we talk about, we talk in these grandiose, grandiose ways of how the Bill of Rights protects the rights of Americans. If you read the Bill of Rights carefully, you'll discover that the rights that are guaranteed in the Bill of Rights are political rights. Nowhere in the Bill of Rights is there a right to drive a Mercedes Benz or a BMW. Nowhere in the Bill of Rights is the right to own a half a million dollar home. Nowhere in the Bill of Rights is the right to send your children to Harvard or Yale or Columbia. No, the rights that are in the Bill of Rights are political rights. Free speech, right? Freedom of the press, uh, the right of peaceable assembly, uh, the right to bear arms, Right, the right to a fair trial by a jury of your peers. All of, and of course, that's an incomplete list, and we'll, uh, we'll mention many more of those as the course continues, but hopefully you'll see that those are political rights. And for, so, so, now wait a minute now, you've got you to gotta take this idea to its logical conclusion. If the Bill of Rights contains political rights and not personal rights, then who is it protecting the people from? And the answer uh, that many of us have never really stopped to think about and might be stunned when I say the Bill of Rights was created to protect the people from their own government. 
Now, many of you are sitting in your PJs there watching this video and you're shaking your head and you're saying, Dr. Trailer, that can't be right. Why would we need to be protected from our own government? Well, the Constitution was written in 1787. The American Revolution had ended in 1783. It had only been over for four years when the uh, Constitution was written. Why did we fight the American Revolution? Because the government was trying to take our rights away. So, um, over the past several hundred years, we tend to lose track of that very significant fact that our government, of course, the government at that time, we were British, right? So who was our government? It was the British government. Our government had, in fact, tried to take our rights away. I mean, what was one, one of the battle cries of the American Revolution? No taxation without representation, right? We said we have a right to not be taxed unless we are represented in Parliament. So you see how all this comes together. The anti, the Federalists uh, were happy with a document that did not contain a Bill of Rights, but the anti-Federalists, who were the little everyday people, the people in the small towns and living on the frontier, those people were terribly afraid that the government might try to take Unless there was a document that listed the rights, they were afraid that the government, now it's the United States government, uh, at some point in the future, would step in and try to take away some of the God-given rights. Now, so this becomes the argument between the Federalists who support ratifying the Constitution just the way it is, without a Bill of Rights, and the Anti-Federalists who oppose it Oppose its ratification without a Bill of Rights. Now, the Federalists do everything that they can do to convince the Federalists. That, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The Federalists did everything they could do to convince the anti Federalists to go ahead and approve the ratification of the Constitution. One of the most famous books to come out of uh, this time in American history is a, a book of individual essays uh, written by three Federalists, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay. And the name of and these essays, there were 85, 85, yeah, <laughs> 85 of them uh, total. Uh, that were bound together into one volume, and the name that was given the volume was the Federalist. Sometimes it's called the Federalist Papers. And these three men wrote a number of essays. Actually, they were, they were sort of like letters to the editor. They would write this essay, and they would send it to their local newspaper. The newspaper would print it, um, and the... Uh, then other newspapers in other cities would pick up that article. They would print it in their newspapers. And so eventually, uh, these essays made their way around the entire United States of America. And one of the things that all of these essays had, all 85 of them had, was uh, in one way or another, they were um, supporting ratification of the Constitution just the way it was written. By the way, uh, Hamilton wrote 50 of those 85 essays. Uh, Madison was right behind him with 30. Was it 30? Yes. Uh, I can remember things happening uh, like a bell, but these numbers sometimes sort of escape me. So yes, I'm right. Uh, Hamilton did 50. Madison did 30. John Jay uh, did five. Now, was, did he only do five because he was not interested in the project? Not at all. Uh, it just so happened that during this time period, John Jay became very ill and almost died. Uh, and so he was unable to write more than five. And we are grateful that he provided those five. 
they were eloquent, they were beautifully written, and something else. They were absolutely useless. Uh, they didn't change the minds of the anti-federalists. Now, today, uh, the Federalist Papers are still precious to us as historians because it gives us a glimpse into the minds of the three of three of the most important founders: Alexander Hamilton, uh, James Madison, and John Jay. Um, uh, but at the time, it did no good. It didn't change anyone's mind. Now, uh, I had mentioned anti federalists I mentioned Patrick Henry a few moments ago. Let me give you a few more names. In addition to Patrick Henry, there was Richard Henry Lee. Um, some of you might remember that it had been Richard Henry Lee who had stood up on the floor of the Second Continental Congress um, and uh, Patrick Henry had said, give me liberty or give me death. Yeah, we all remember that. Ooh, uh, but Richard Henry Lee is remembered by historians as well because he was one of the first members of the Second Continental Congress to get up and officially say that he thought that we should declare our independence from England. Um, Sam Adams was another one of the anti federal so, um, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists contained uh, men who were patriots, men who loved America. Uh, we cannot call any of them anti-patriotic or anti-American. They just had different ideas about the content of the Constitution. Well, the Federalists did their best to change the minds of the Anti-Federalists, and they absolutely and totally failed. So, what did the Federalists do? I mean, we know that there is a Bill of Rights in the Constitution now. Where did it come from? Well, the Federalists basically surrendered. They surrendered to the Anti-Federalists. Uh, the, the Federalists said, all right, <laughs> you win. Um, if you will, they said to the Anti-Federalists, if you will drop your opposition, and if you will let us go ahead and ratify the Constitution the way it's written without a Bill of Rights, the, the Federalists promised that as soon as the first Congress, the first session of Congress met, that one of the first orders of business would be very simple. They would create a Bill of Rights. Now, this didn't make all of the anti-Federalists happy, but it made enough of them happy uh, to where the Constitution was uh, ratified eventually by all 13 of the state. Now, what did it take to put the Constitution into place? Uh, let's go back to the document that was replaced by the Constitution, the old Articles of Confederation. Uh, the Articles of Confederation had some serious problems, uh, and we're not going to dig too deeply into that, but I will tell you this. There were two uh, uh, main problems that were possessed by the Articles of Confederation. First of all, uh, the Articles of Confederation did not give to the national government the power to coerce obedience from its people. Now, what's coercion? It's being forced to do something. Uh, some, maybe you're forced to do something you like. Maybe you're forced to do something you don't like. But that's what coercion is. Now, some of you, once again, are saying, oh, Dr. Trotter, nobody coerces me to do anything. I'm an American. The next time that you get on Interstate 12, go ahead and put the cruise control on 90 miles an hour and see what happens to you eventually. It might take a while, but eventually you're going to look in your in your rearview mirror and there's going to be a state trooper back there with his lights on. And he's going to pull you over and he's going to give you a ticket. He's going to coerce you to obey the speed limits. So one of the problems that the Articles of Confederation had was it could not coerce people to obey the laws. Everyone operated on the honor system. 
Now, I will grant you that if we all did the right thing simply because it was the right thing, that would be a wonderful society, wouldn't it? But that's not human nature. Human nature is to get away with everything we can get away with. And as a result, uh, the government that was created by the Articles of Confederation didn't have a lot of power. Yeah, that was the first problem. What was the second problem? The second problem is that in order to get anything done by the Articles of Confederation required, here's a fancy word, unanimity. Unanimity. Okay, it's based on the word unanimous. In other words, unanimity means that everybody, every single person has to agree. So, in the case of the Articles of Confederation government, in order to amend, in order to change the Articles of Confederation, required unanimity. All 13 states had to agree to it. Uh, in order to create a tax, required unanimity. All 13 states had to agree to it. As a matter of fact, uh, the very act of ratifying the Articles of Confederation themselves required unanimity. All 13 states had to agree to it. Now, it didn't take long for Americans to realize that they had probably made a mistake in creating the, the government uh, that was operating under the Articles of Confederation. But in order to change the government, the government required unanimity. And these 13 early states, they quite often just didn't really like each other a lot. And they were like children. They were jealous. If, if another state got something, then they wanted that thing themselves, even if it didn't make sense. And so, as a result of the problems that was caused by this insistence on unanimity by the Articles of Confederation uh, and the inability of the national government to coerce obedience from its uh, citizens, uh, the Constitution uh, was not nearly as strict. In order for the Constitution to be ratified and put into uh, into working order required not unanimity but a 9 out of 13 majority. That's all it was going to take. Any 9 states that voted to ratify uh, would put the Constitution into effect. Well, as it turned out, and, then, and I'm not going to ask you to remember all of this, but Delaware, as it turned out, was the first state to ratify. To ratify. Um, and the uh, last state, uh, the ninth state, the important state uh, to ratify was New Hampshire. Uh, and so when New Hampshire ratified, uh, that meant that the Constitution was going to go into effect. The problem is that there are 13, there are 13 states, right? So... When New Hampshire ratifies as the ninth state, that means that there are four states that have not ratified. And those four states, and I'm going to ask you to remember this, what were the four states that didn't ratify? What were numbers 10, 11, 12, and 13? Well, uh, New York was one of them. North Carolina was one of them. Virginia was one of them, and Rhode Island was one of them. Now, without going into great details, and you can join me for my Constitution class, which I uh, teach regularly. It's Political Science 201, right? It's called American Government, but I teach it as a Constitution class. Uh, but you welcome to join me for that in some future semester. Um Eventually, all 13 of the states do, in fact, ratify. And it, it does uh, reflect unanimity. But it takes a while. Now, upon receiving word that New Hampshire, the ninth state, had ratified 
Everyone knew that the Constitution was now going to go into effect, with or without those other four states. And so uh, the uh, Articles of Confederation Congress began to make plans basically to go out of existence. Uh, the Articles of Confederation go out of existence, and at about the same time, the Constitution comes into existence. Uh, New York City was chosen as the new national capital. Now, the Constitution says that there will be a special city that is set aside to be the nation's capital, and that did in fact happen, and that property would eventually be referred to as Washington, D.C., uh, and it's the permanent capital. But before all that takes place, the first capital of the country under the Constitution, and let's be very careful here, the nation had a capital before this, uh, but they were operating under the Articles of Confederation. What I'm telling you is that under the Constitution, the first national capital was New York City. All that happens in 1789. Um, let's talk about America in 1790, though. Now, why, you know, it, it comes into existence, right, in 1789, but I want to talk about 1790. Why? What is significant about the year 1790 that causes me to want to talk about what's happening in 1790? And the answer is very simple. The first United States census ever was conducted in 1790. So, uh, we have some real numbers. We don't have to guess about what was going on in America. We can look at the 1790 census and know what was going on. Now, an interesting little sideline here. Uh, only fragments of that original 1790 census uh, exist because during the War of 1812, that census was stored in Washington, D.C., and the British burned Washington, D.C. in the War of 1812 and destroyed most of the census. But it's not as bad as it sounds because there had been copies made, and so we pretty, pretty much know what was in the census. So we can make legitimate references to the content of that first census, the census of 1790. So, what did America look like in 1790? Well, first of all, it stretched from the Atlantic Ocean all the way to the Mississippi River. It stretched, the northern boundary was Canada. Now, nobody knew exactly where that boundary was, but generally, both the British, which owned, who owned Canada, and the Americans agreed that the boundary was somewhere up there, wherever the boundary of Canada, wherever the southern boundary of Canada was, that was the northern boundary of the United States. Now, in a few years, and we'll get to that in this course, in a few years, there will be uh, several treaties between the United States uh, and uh, England, and one of those treaties will be very specific on what that boundary is. In 1790, it was not etched in stone yet. They just knew it was up there somewhere. So, eastern boundary was Atlantic. Western boundary was the Mississippi River. Northern boundary was <laughs> the southern boundary of Canada, wherever the heck that was. So, what was the southern boundary? Some of you are saying, oh, Gulf of Mexico. If you're saying that, you would be wrong. And the reason you'd be wrong is that there was land in the way. Florida, in 1790, was owned by the Spanish. Now, today, Florida, the present-day state of Florida, uh, the eastern, the, I'm sorry, the western boundary of the present-day state of Florida, uh, hits the Gulf of Mexico uh, somewhere between Pensacola and Mobile, right? Not then. The western boundary of Florida went all the way to the Mississippi River, 
that time. Florida was much larger then than it is now. And that is why we cannot say that the southern boundary uh, of the United States was uh, the northern. Uh, when, I'm sorry, we can't say that the southern boundary went all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. What we can say accurately is that the southern boundary of the United States was the northern boundary of Florida. Now, it wouldn't be for much longer, but in 1790, uh, it certainly was. Um, Four million people lived in the United States. Um, About 20% of those people were Africans, and most of them were slaves. About 20% of the total population um, was African And most of them, not all of them, there were some free uh, people that what was referred to then as free people of color, right? They were free. They were not slaves. They were Africans. Um, Most of those Africans lived in the South. Now, let me stop right here and tell you something. Uh, And here's something that some of you know and some of you don't know. And if you don't know it, you're getting ready to be shocked. Every state of the Union, every one of the 13 states in 1790 was a slave state. Oh, no, Dr. Trello, that can't be right. Slavery was a southern institution. That's why we fought the Civil War. Well, the reality is that that becomes the truth. Slavery becomes a southern institution. But it's later. 1790, there were slaves in every single one of the 13 states. Now, what is also true is that most of them lived in the South, but there were slaves in all 13 of the slave, uh, of the state. It was a predominantly a rural society. We were not we were not industrialized. We were not even close to being industrialized. It was, an, it was an agricultural society. Now, each state uh, varied a little bit between what, you know, what crops they produced. Um, you know, the, the southern states were producing uh, things that required a long growing season and rich, deep soil like tobacco, uh, sugarcane, rice. You'll notice that I didn't mention cotton. Cotton was not a major crop in the year 1790. Um, And there was a main, there was one main reason why cotton was not important. Uh, If any of you are familiar with cotton, you'll know that there, that plant, uh, the cotton bowl, that white thing, right? uh, It's composed of two parts. There's the fluff. And then there's the seed. And in order to take the fluff and weave it into thread, uh, spin it into thread, and then weave it into cloth, it requires, it absolutely requires that the seeds be removed. And the seeds were very difficult to remove from the cotton bowl, B O L L. And as a result, very few people grew cotton because it was. Uh, it took up so much time to remove the cotton seed from the cotton fiber. Now, it's not going to be far down the road uh, before a man by the name of Eli Whitney perfects a cotton gin. G-I-N. By the way, that's an abbreviation for the word engine. Right? Cotton gin will uh, make the, re- the separation of the cotton seed from the cotton fiber very easy. And boy, when that happens, cotton cultivation takes off. And it becomes, we like to call it king cotton. Every southern state grew as much cotton as they could. And that's true, but it did not happen until after the perfection of the cotton gin. And that was of around 1795 or so. Before then, cotton was not important. After that, cotton just took off like gangbusters. Very few cities in 1790 had populations of more than 5,000 people. 
I had mentioned earlier that what they call cities, uh, uh, people in real cities like Paris and London would have laughed at. Now, the census of 1790 did not, there was one group that did not count, it was the Indians. Because in order to count the Indians, it required for somebody to go into the Indian villages and count the Indians. Uh, and that was very risky business. And, and so we have no idea how many Indians lived within the boundaries of the United States in 1790. But we think, we think that there were as still as many as 150,000 who lived within the boundaries of uh, the United States. Most Americans in 1790 still lived in the original 13 colonies, the original 13 states. Um, Americans were beginning, though, to cross the uh, Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains served as the western boundary for several of the, of the states. And uh, the mountains had sort of served to keep uh, the people on the east side of the mountains. Uh, but after, uh, by 1790, more and more Americans were moving west of the Appalachians. Um, uh, a best guess, uh, well, no, it's not a best guess. It's supported by the census, right? Uh, about 125,000 people, 150,000, I'm sorry, 150,000 uh, lived west of the Appalachian in 1790. Historians tend to divide those early 13 colonies and then those uh, 13 states into three uh, geographical locations. New England, the middle colonies, uh, or the middle states, uh, and the southern states. Uh, and so let's, let's stay with that uh, division uh, because it's a handy way uh, to handle the differences between those two three areas of the country. New England was a, an area of small villages and really busy, small ports, but really busy ports. Uh, New England was on the verge of, of the very beginnings of industrialization. It was primitive industrialization. We today would look at it and probably shake our head and laugh. But for them, it was a big deal. These beginnings of using machines to do work that human backs and human muscles had done uh, prior to this time. Um, the soil of New England was poor. Uh, it was shallow soil. It was rocky soil. It was not rich soil, and it wasn't fit to do much. Uh, if you were a New England farmer, about the best you could expect out of your land was for to raise enough food to feed yourself. Certainly, you probably wouldn't be able to raise um, uh, excess crop to sell as a cash crop. And as a result of having, uh, it, it, it's been said that the thing that New England soil grows best is rocks. Uh, and there's a lot of truth in that. I remember the first time that my wife and I traveled in New England. We were just amazed and stunned by how pretty these New England farms were and all these beautiful stone fences. Um, but there was a reason why those stone fences were there. If you expected to, to farm any land in New England, the first thing you had to do was dig up those rocks. And it was back breaking it might have looked romantic but it i would imagine that these old new england farmers when they looked at those fences they just shuddered as they uh, remembered the back breaking labor that was taken that was required to build that fence and because the soil was so poor new england never becomes a real important agricultural area what New England does is they turn to the ocean and use it as a farm. They farm the ocean. They become fishermen because the oceans off the New England coast were 
full of fish and almost endless <laughs> supply of fish. And so New England fishermen uh, start the industry. Um, and then uh, they decide, well, look, if we're going to be fishermen out in the ocean, uh, let's stop buying our boats from England. Let's go and buy boats. Let's make our own boats. And so they began the boat building industry. Um, and they began the barrel making industry in which the store the fish rather than buying barrels from England or, for some, or from somewhere else. So you can see how fishing, I'm sorry, you can see how fishing uh, sort of jump starts other related industries. Uh, the South had a very diverse uh, agricultural economy. We've already mentioned some of the Southern crops that were very, very important. Uh, indigo is one we didn't mention. Indigo is a source of a, a rich, beautiful, bluish, purplish dye. Indigo. Tobacco. Uh, tobacco grew wild in North America when the first Europeans got here. Uh, in Virginia, uh, one of those early Virginians, a man by the name of John Rolfe, R-O-L-F-E, uh, who became the husband of Pocahontas. Uh, Rolfe um, was sort of an amateur uh, agriculturalist, and he noticed these plants growing all over the place, and, and he knew from uh, his relationships to the local Indians that the Indians used that tobacco in some of their uh, rituals. And so he had the bright idea that maybe he could transform tobacco into some type of a commercial, profitable crop. The problem, of course, was that it was bitter. But Rolf was patient. And in a day before scientific experimentation, was became common, Rolf was, in fact, experimenting with tobacco uh, and attempting to develop a, a breed uh, of tobacco that wasn't quite as bitter. And he succeeded. Um, and tobacco becomes the main crop of both Virginia and its next door neighbor, Maryland, and to a lesser degree, uh, Virginia's south, Virginia's neighbor in the southeast, um, North Carolina. These become the tobacco growing parts of the uh, of the new nation. Uh, of course, grains grew well. Uh, hemp, uh, hemp was used to make uh, rope. Now today. We have polypropylene and polyethylene rope, right? We have these artificial strands to make ropes. But back in those days, they used natural uh, fibers, and most of those <coughs> came from the hemp plant, which, by the way, is the first cousin of marijuana. And then, after the perfection of the cotton gin in the 1790s, cotton became more and more and more common, it became more and more popular, it became, it became more and more profitable. Uh, and so cotton, uh, we need to add cotton to our list, but we always need to remember that cotton was a Johnny come lately. Cotton was one, not one of the original main crops of the South. In fact, it was the last of the uh, profitable, profitable crops to be, uh, to be developed. And sadly, uh, cotton depended on slave labor for its production. Now, there are the middle states, right? The middle states uh, are not unique, 
except to say that the middle states, which included places like New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, uh, those states exhibited some of the characteristics of the New England states and some of the characteristics of the southern states. There were a lot of big farms in certain parts of the middle states, especially on the Hudson River Valley. There were farms up there that had thousands of acres. Now, the first Congress met in the year 1789. Elections had been held in 1788. Washington had been elected president, right? John Adams had been elected vice president. Uh, the first senators had been elected. The first U.S. representatives had been elected. And they all meet in the new capital, uh, New York City. Um, in the spring of 1789. Uh, the electoral votes were counted and George Washington got all of them. <laughs> you know, today, uh, sometimes we're guilty of just thinking of George Washington as just another American president. And I that saddens me. I and many historians are agree, who agree with me are convinced that without Washington as our first president, I mean, we'll never know, right? I mean, how do you prove a negative? Uh, but I'm convinced in my heart that the nation probably would not have survived had not George Washington been the first president of the United States. And he was reelected to a second term, so he served for eight years at the very beginning. Washington was a reluctant president. Uh, Washington had a, already accomplished as much in his life uh, as most men much older than him could ever expect to accomplish. Uh, he, had been, uh, he had been a soldier uh, in the Virginia militia during the French and Indian War. Matter of fact, uh, join me for History 474 sometime, if you're a history major especially. Uh, and we'll talk about how George Washington actually starts the Indian War. But that, we don't have time for that, okay? You'll have to join me for that course at a later date. But, so he's a, he's an officer in the Virginia militia. Um, he is chosen as the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army during the American Revolution. After the American Revolution is over, uh, he is uh, elected to... Uh, the uh, Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia that writes the Constitution. He is not only elected to it, but he is the presiding officer. He's the guy up front with a gavel in his hand. Oh, excuse me. Itchy nose. Hmm. Uh, he's got the gavel in his hand, and he's making the decisions like, okay, it's your turn to speak. All right, going to get up. Now, you've talked enough. <laughs> Hush. Somebody else talked. He was the guy up front making those decisions. Um, by the time the Constitution was ratified, and uh, it was clear to most Americans that there was only one man who could be the president, and that was George Washington. George Washington, by this time, uh, was tired, and he was getting old. Uh, Washington wanted nothing more than to retire. He wanted to leave the public eye. He wanted to go back to his farm in Virginia to Mount Vernon uh, and do what he had always loved to do, which is simply be a farmer. But Americans would not hear of that. <laughs> they insisted. Uh, and Washington, um, I think, at a certain internal level, understood that uh, his uh, approval, his acceptance of the presidency might make all the difference in the world toward, toward the survival of the country. But for whatever the reason, 
he becomes the first president. Um, and he is elected to a second term. Now, what were some of the things that were accomplished once Washington and Adams were inaugurated as president and vice president? What were some of the other things that began to take place uh, in the forming of the United States government? Well, there were a number of things. First of all, um, Congress creates the so-called executive departments. Uh, what the heck is that? Well, those are the departments of the government. For example, the Treasury Department was created at this time, um, and Washington uh, nominates uh, his old friend, uh, Alexander Hamilton, to be the first Secretary of the Treasury. It was a great choice, by the way. Um, Thomas Jefferson was uh, nominated by Washington to become the first Secretary of State. In other words, America's top diplomat, other than the President, of course. Um Edmund Randolph, now that's a name you might not be really familiar with, but some of you are. Edmund Randolph was chosen as the first attorney general. Uh, what's the attorney general? He's the, he's the nation's uh, top lawyer. He's the guy um, who, whose main purpose is to make sure that the laws are obeyed. Also, now of course this was not a cabinet level position. Uh, but John Jay uh, was chosen, was nominated by Washington uh, to become the first uh, Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, Supreme Court. So, uh, and other departments would be uh, created at about the same time, but these are among the first. Uh, state with Thomas Jefferson. Treasury with Alexander Hamilton, uh, Attorney General with Edmund Randolph, uh, and then, of course, uh, the Chief Justice being nominated by uh, President Washington as well. The Federalists kept their promise to the Anti-Federalists. Uh, almost immediately after the Congress began to meet, um, a Bill of Rights was, in fact, uh, introduced into the Congress by none other than James Madison. Um, and true to their, the, and the, the Federalists were true to their word. Remember, that's the promise they had made to the Anti-Federalists. Go ahead and ratify it without a Bill of Rights, and we promise you that as soon as we can, we will create the Bill of Rights, and they do. Because honorable men keep their word, don't they? I mean, today, we make a promise in the morning, and by noon, we've broken the promise half a dozen times, and we think nothing of it. But back in those days, if you made a promise, and you didn't keep that promise, you lost your honor, which is the most important thing in your life, was your honor. So, the Bill of Rights was, in fact, um, completed. Let's talk <clears throat> about Alexander Hamilton's vision for America, because Hamilton was one of the primary founding fathers. He was one of the, uh, he, he didn't take part a, a lot in the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia because, well, to be quite honest with you, Hamilton was a jerk. Have you ever known anyone who was really, really smart? And they wanted you to know how smart they were? Not only did they want you to know how smart they were, they wanted you to confess that they are smarter than you. Well, that was Alexander Hamilton. He had an ego that was so big that his head wouldn't fit through the door. But that didn't change the fact that Alexander Hamilton was a genius 
with regards to finance. He truly was. It was such a, uh, a di diversity in his character that he could be so you know, jerk and then at the same time be a genius. Washington recognized his genius and chose to sort of ignore the jerk part because Washington had this ability to separate private feelings from public feelings. But there were others who didn't have that talent. And as a matter of fact, eventually Alexander Hamilton is going to let his mouth run away with him once too often. He angers uh, the vice president of the United States, a man by the name of Aaron Burr, B-U-R-R. -R. Uh, and the two men fight a duel and Burr kills Alexander Hamilton graveyard dead. So, uh, think about what you say before you say it. Because, well, we all know that our mouths can get us into serious trouble sometimes, right? And that won't be an exam. That's just a free little tidbit of information. Remember that the United States have been created out of the thin air. We didn't have any money. Uh, what money we had, we borrowed from individuals, we borrowed from banks, we borrowed from other countries. Um, and there was a real problem. People were concerned about how we were going to pay back the money that we had borrowed in order to pay for the American Revolution. The American Revolution, sorry, I got the hiccups. Uh, and this becomes, as Secretary of the Treasury, this becomes one of Hamilton's major tasks is to pay off the debt and balance the budget. And let's talk about Hamilton for just a little bit, his background. Hamilton was um, born in the Caribbean. Um, it's, we think that he was illegitimate, right? His mama never married, his daddy never married his mama. Um, as a teenager, he went to work for an important businessman there in the Caribbean um, and very quickly earned the trust and the respect of that businessman. As a matter of fact, uh, he trusted Hamilton so much that he basically turned over running the business to a teenager. Um, Hamilton uh, decided that he wanted to go to college. The nearest college was in the United States, or it was in the colonies at that time. Uh, so he does, in fact, uh, come to the, to the British colonies. He goes to college. Um, and when the American Revolution breaks out, he joins the Continental Army and fights on the side of the Americans. Um, and he comes to the attention of the commander in chief of the Continental Army, George Washington. And he becomes, Washington never had any children. Now, his wife, Martha, had children from a previous marriage, but she and George never had any children. So Hamilton sort of becomes the son that Washington never had. They become really, really close. After the war was over, uh, Hamilton becomes an attorney. Um, he marries a very wealthy young woman uh, from a very wealthy family in New York State. So he's got it made, right? <laughs> got a college education. He's a friend of Washington and he's married to a rich woman. But he didn't stop there. Uh, remember I said earlier that he had written, pardon me, 50 of the 85 Federalist Papers. With that cough right there, that brings me right up to one hour.
for the lecture. So I'm going to stop here. So uh, let me repeat myself from the beginning. This is History 475. This is lecture number one. I'm going to say goodbye to you now, and we will pick it up. Uh, we will continue our examination of Alexander Hamilton um, in lecture two, which follows this. Until then.